Chapters 13 and 14 of Looking Backward. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anna Simon. Looking Backward, 2000 to 1887, by Edward Bellamy. Chapter 13. As Edith had promised he should do, Dr. Leed accompanied me to my bedroom when I retired, to instruct me as to the adjustment of the musical telephone. He showed how, by turning a screw, the volume of the music could be made to fill the room, or die away to an echo as so faint and far that one could scarcely be sure whether he heard or imagined it. If, of two persons side by side, one desired to listen to music and the other to sleep, it could be made audible to one and inaudible to another. "'I should strongly advise you to sleep if you can tonight, Mr. West, in preference to listening to the finest tunes in the world,' the doctor said, after explaining these points. "'In the trying experience you are just now passing through, sleep is a nerve tonic for which there is no substitute.' Mindful of what had happened to me that very morning, I promised to heed his counsel. "'Very well,' he said. "'Then I will set the telephone at eight o'clock.' "'What do you mean?' I asked." He explained that, by a clockwork combination, a person could arrange to be wakened at any hour by the music. It began to appear, as has since fully proved to be the case, that I had left my tendency to insomnia behind me with the other discomforts of existence in the nineteenth century, for though I took no sleeping draught this time, yet, as the night before, I had no sooner touched the pillow than I was asleep. I dreamt that I sat on the throne of the Eben Charachs in the Bagnetic Hall of the Alhambra, feasting my lords and generals, who next day were to follow the crescent against the Christian dogs of Spain. The air, cooled by the spray of fountains, was heavy with the scent of flowers. A band of nouch girls, round-limbed and luscious-lipped, danced with voluptuous grace to the music of brazen and stringed instruments. Looking up to the latticed galleries, one caught a gleam now and then from the eye of some beauty of the royal harem looking down upon the assembled flower of Moorish chivalry. Louder and louder clashed the cymbals, wilder and wilder grew the strain, till the blood of the desert race could no longer resist the martial delirium, and the sword nobles leapt to their feet. A thousand scimitars were bared, and the cry, Allah, il Allah, shook the hall and awoke me, to find it broad daylight and the room tingling with the electric music of the Turkish reveille. At the breakfast-table, when I told my host of my morning's experience, I learned that it was not a mere chance that the piece of music which awakened me was a reveille. The airs played at one of the halls during the waking hours of the morning were always of an inspiring type. "'By the way,' I said, "'I have not thought to ask you anything about the state of Europe. Have the societies of the old world also been remodelled?' "'Yes,' replied Dr. Leet. "'The great nations of Europe—' as well as Australia, Mexico, and parts of South America, are now organized industrially like the United States, which was the pioneer of the evolution. The peaceful relations of these nations are assured by a loose form of federal union of worldwide extent. An international council regulates the mutual intercourse and commerce of the members of the union, and their joint policy toward the more backward races, which are gradually being educated up to civilized institutions, Complete autonomy within its own limits is enjoyed by every nation. "'How do you carry on commerce without money?' I said. "'In trading with other nations you must use some sort of money, although you dispense with it in the internal affairs of the nation.' "'Oh, no. Money is as superfluous in our foreign as in our internal relations. When foreign commerce was conducted by private enterprise, money was necessary to adjust it on account of the multifarious complexity of the transactions.' But nowadays it is a function of the nations as units. There are thus only a dozen or so merchants in the world, and their business being supervised by the International Council, a simple system of book accounts serves perfectly to regulate their dealings. Customs duties of every sort are, of course, superfluous. A nation simply does not import what its government does not think requisite for the general interest. Each nation has a bureau of foreign exchange, which manages its trading. For example, the American Bureau, estimating such and such quantities of French goods necessary to America for a given year, sends the order to the French Bureau, which in turn sends its order to our Bureau. The same is done mutually by all the nations. But how are the prices of foreign goods settled, since there is no competition? The price at which one nation supplies another with goods, replied Dr. Leed, 
must be that at which it supplies its own citizens. So you see there is no danger of misunderstanding. Of course, no nation is theoretically bound to supply another with a product of its own labor, but it is for the interest of all to exchange some commodities. If a nation is regularly supplying another with certain goods, notice is required from either side of any important change in the relation. But what if a nation, having a monopoly of some natural product, should refuse to supply it to the others, or to one of them? Such a case has never occurred, and could not, without doing the refusing party vastly more harm than the others, replied Dr. Leed. In the first place, no favoritism could be legally shown. The law requires that each nation shall deal with the others in all respects on exactly the same footing. Such a cause as you suggest would cut off the nation adopting it from the remaining of the earth for all purposes whatever. The contingency is one that need not give us much anxiety. But, said I, supposing a nation, having a natural monopoly in some product of which it exports more than it consumes, should put the price away up, and thus, without cutting off the supply, make a profit out of its neighbor's necessities. Its own citizens would, of course, have to pay the higher price on that commodity, but as a body would make more out of foreigners than they would be out of pocket themselves. When you come to know how prices of all commodities are determined nowadays, you will perceive how impossible it is that they could be altered, except with reference to the amount or arduousness of the work required respectively to produce them, was Dr. Leeds' reply. This principle is an international as well as a national guarantee, but even without it the sense of community of interest, international as well as national, and the conviction of the folly of selfishness are too deep nowadays to render possible such a piece of sharp practice as you apprehend. You must understand that we all look forward to an eventual unification of the world as one nation. That, no doubt, will be the ultimate form of society, and will realize certain economic advantages over the present federal system of autonomous nations. Meanwhile, however, the present system works so nearly perfectly that we are quite content to leave to posterity the completion of the scheme. There are, indeed, some who hold that it never will be completed, on the ground that the federal plan is not merely a provisional solution of the problem of human society, but the best ultimate solution. "'How do you manage?' I asked when the books of any two nations do not balance. Supposing we import more from France than we export to her. At the end of each year, replied the doctor, the books of every nation are examined. If France is found in our debt, probably we are in the debt of some nation which owes France, and so on with all the nations. The balances that remain after the accounts have been cleared by the International Council should not be large under our system. Whatever they may be, the Council requires them to be settled every few years, and may require their settlement at any time if they are getting too large, for it is not intended that any nation shall run largely in debt to another, lest feelings unfavorable to amity should be engendered. To guard further against this, the International Council inspects the commodities interchanged by the nations, to see that they are of perfect quality. But what are the balances finally settled with, seeing that you have no money? In national staples. A basis of agreement is as to what staples shall be accepted and in what proportions, for settlement of accounts being a preliminary to trade relations. Emigration is another point I want to ask you about, said I. With every nation organized as a close industrial partnership, monopolizing all means of production in the country, the emigrant, even if he were permitted to land, would starve. I suppose there is no emigration nowadays. On the contrary, there is constant emigration, by which I suppose you mean removal to foreign countries for permanent residence, replied Dr. Lees. It is arranged on a simple international arrangement of indemnities. For example, if a man at twenty-one emigrates from England to America, England loses all the expense of his maintenance and education, and America gets a workman for nothing. America accordingly makes England an allowance. The same principle, varied to suit the case, applies generally. If the man is near the term of his labor when he emigrates, the country receiving him has the allowance. As to imbecile persons, it is deemed best that each nation should be responsible for its own, and the emigration of such must be under full guarantees of support by his own nation. Subject to these regulations, the right of any man to emigrate at any time is unrestricted. 
But how about mere pleasure trips, tours of observation? How can a stranger travel in a country whose people do not receive money, and are themselves supplied with the means of life on a basis not extended to him? His own credit card cannot, of course, be good in other lands. How does he pay his way? An American credit card, replied Dr. Leed, is just as good in Europe as American gold used to be, and on precisely the same condition, namely, that it be exchanged into the currency of the country you are travelling in. An American in Berlin takes his credit card to the local office of the International Council and receives in exchange for the whole or part of it a German credit card, the amount being charged against the United States in favour of Germany on the international account. "'Perhaps Mr. West would like to dine at the Elephant today,' said Edith, as we left the table. "'That is the name we give to the general dining-house in our ward,' explained her father. "'Not only is our cooking done at the public kitchens, as I told you last night, but the service and quality of the meals are much more satisfactory if taken at the dining-house. The two minor meals of the day are usually taken at home, as not worth the trouble of going out, but it is general to go out to dine.' We have not done so since you have been with us, from a notion that it would be better to wait till you had become a little more familiar with our ways. What do you think? Shall we take dinner at the dining-house to-day? I said that I should be very much pleased to do so. Not long after, Edith came to me, smiling, and said, Last night, as I was thinking what I could do to make you feel at home, until you came to be a little more used to us and our ways, an idea occurred to me. What would you say if I were to introduce you to some very nice people of your own times, whom I am sure you used to be well acquainted with? I replied rather vaguely that it would certainly be very agreeable, but I did not see how she was going to manage it. Come with me, was our smiling reply, and see if I am not as good as my word. My susceptibility to surprise had been pretty well exhausted by the numerous shocks it had received, but it was with some wonderment that I followed her into a room which I had not before entered. It was a small, cosy apartment, walled with cases filled with books. "'Here are your friends,' said Edith, indicating one of the cases, and as my eye glanced over the names on the backs of the volumes, Shakespeare, Milton, Wordsworth, Shelley, Tennyson, Defoe, Dickens, Thackeray, Hugo, Hawthorne, Irving, and a score of other great writers of my time at all time, I understood her meaning. She had indeed made good her promise in a sense compared with which its literal fulfilment would have been a disappointment.' She had introduced me to a circle of friends whom the century that had elapsed since last I communed with them had aged as little as it had myself. Their spirit was as high, their wit as keen, their laughter and their tears as contagious as when their speech had whiled away the hours of a former century. Lonely I was not, and could not be more, with this goodly companionship, however wide the gulf of years that gaped between me and my old life. "'You are glad I brought you here,' exclaimed Edith radiant, as she read in my face the success of her experiment. It was a good idea, was it not, Mr. West? How stupid in me not to think of it before! I will leave you now with your old friends, for I know there will be no company for you like them just now. But remember, you must not let old friends make you quite forget new ones. And with that smiling caution she left me. Attracted by the most familiar of the names before me, I laid my hand on a volume of Dickens and sat down to read. He had been my prime favourite among the book-writers of the century, I mean, the nineteenth century, and a week had rarely passed in my old life during which I had not taken up some volume of his works to while away an idle hour. Any volume with which I had been familiar would have produced an extraordinary impression, read under my present circumstances. But my exceptional familiarity with Dickens, and his consequent power to call up the associations of my former life, gave to his writings an effect no others could have had, to intensify, by force of contrast, my appreciation of the strangeness of my present environment. However new and astonishing one's surroundings, the tendency is to become a part of them so soon that almost from the first the power to see them objectively and fully measure their strangeness is lost. That power, already dulled in my case, the pages of Dickens restored by carrying me back through their associations to the standpoint of my former life. With a clearness which I had not been able to before to attain, I saw now the past and present like contrasting pictures side by side. The genius of the great novelist of the nineteenth century, like that of Homer, might indeed defy time, but the setting of his pathetic tales, 
the misery of the poor, the wrongs of power, the pitiless cruelty of the system of society, had passed away as utterly as Circe and the Sirens, Charybdis and Cyclops. During the hour or two that I sat there with Dickens open before me, I did not actually read more than a couple of pages. Every paragraph, every phrase, brought up some new aspect of the world transformation which had taken place, and led my thoughts on long and widely ramifying excursions. As meditating thus in Dr. Leeds' library, I gradually attained a more clear and coherent idea of the prodigious spectacle which I had been so strangely enabled to view. I was filled with a deepening wonder at the seeming capriciousness of the fate that had given to one who so little deserved it, or seemed in any way set apart for it, the power alone among his contemporaries to stand upon the earth in this latter day. I had neither foreseen the new world nor toiled for it, as many about me had done, regardless of the scorn of fools or the misconstruction of the good. Surely it would have been more in accordance with the fitness of things had one of those prophetic and strenuous souls been enabled to see the travail of his soul and be satisfied. He, for example, a thousand times rather than I, who, having beheld in a vision the world I looked on, sang of it in words that again and again during these last wondrous days had rung in my mind. For I dipped into the future, far as human eye could see, saw the vision of the world, and all the wonder that would be, till the war-drum throbbed no longer, and the battle-flags were furled, in the Parliament of Man, the Federation of the World. Then the common sense of most shall hold a fretful realm in awe, and the kindly earth shall slumber, lapped in universal law. For I doubt not, through the ages, one increasing purpose runs, and the thoughts of men are widened with the process of the suns. What, though, in his old age, he momentarily lost faith in his own prediction, as prophets in their hours of depression and doubt generally do, the words had remained eternal testimony to the seership of a poet's heart, the insight that is given to faith. I was still in the library when some hours later Dr. Leed sought me there. Edith told me of her idea, he said and I thought it an excellent one. I had a little curiosity what writer you would first turn to. Ah, Dickens, you admired him, then. That is where we moderns agree with you. Judged by our standards, he overtops all the writers of his age, not because his literary genius was highest, but because his great heart beat for the poor, because he made the cause of the victims of society his own, and devoted his pen to exposing its cruelties and shams. No man of his time did so much as he to turn men's minds to the wrong and wretchedness of the old order of things, and open their eyes to the necessity of the great change that was coming, although he himself did not clearly foresee it. CHAPTER fourteen. A heavy rainstorm came up during the day, and I had concluded that the condition of the streets would be such that my hosts would have to give up the idea of going out to dinner, although the dining hall I had understood to be quite near. I was much surprised when at the dinner hour the ladies appeared prepared to go out, but without either rubbers or umbrellas. The mystery was explained when we found ourselves on the street, for a continuous waterproof covering had been let down so as to enclose the sidewalk and turn it into a well-lighted and perfectly dry corridor, which was filled with a stream of ladies and gentlemen dressed for dinner. At the corners the entire open space was similarly roofed in. Edith Leet, with whom I walked, seemed much interested in learning what appeared to be entirely new to her, that in the stormy weather the streets of the Boston of my day had been impassable, except to persons protected by umbrellas, boots, and heavy clothing. "'Were sidewalk coverings not used at all?' she asked. "'They were used,' I explained, but in a scattered and utterly unsystematic way, being private enterprises. She said to me that at the present time all the streets were provided against inclement weather in the manner I saw, the apparatus being rolled out of the way when it was unnecessary. She intimated that it would be considered an extraordinary imbecility to permit the weather to have any effect on the social movements of the people. Dr. Leed, who was walking ahead, overhearing something of our talk, turned to say that the difference between the age of individualism and that of concert was well characterized by the fact that, in the nineteenth century, when it rained, the people of Boston put up three hundred thousand umbrellas over as many heads, and in the twentieth century they put up one umbrella over all the heads. As we walked on, Edith said, 
The private umbrella is father's favorite figure to illustrate the old way when everybody lived for himself and his family. There is a nineteenth-century painting at the art gallery representing a crowd of people in the rain, each one holding his umbrella over himself and his wife, and giving his neighbors the drippings, which he claims must have been meant by the artist as a satire on his times. We now entered a large building into which a stream of people was pouring. I could not see the front, owing to the awning, but if in correspondence with the interior, which was even finer than the store I visited the day before, it would have been magnificent. My companion said that the sculptured group over the entrance was especially admired. Going up a grand staircase, we walked some distance along a broad corridor with many doors opening upon it. At one of these, which bore my host's name, we turned in, and I found myself in an elegant dining-room containing a table for four. Windows opened on a courtyard where a fountain played to a great height and music made the air electric. "'You seem at home here,' I said, as we seated ourselves at table, and Dr. Leed touched an annunciator. "'This is, in fact, a part of our house, slightly detached from the rest,' he replied. "'Every family in the ward has a room set apart in this great building for its permanent and exclusive use for a small annual rental. For transient guests and individuals there is accommodation on another floor. If we expect to dine here, we put in our orders the night before, selecting anything in market according to the daily report in the papers. The meal is as expensive or as simple as we please, though of course everything is vastly cheaper as well as better than it would be prepared at home. There is actually nothing which our people take more interest in than the perfection of the catering and cooking done for them, and I admit that we are a little vain of the success that has been attained by this branch of the service. Ah, my dear Mr. West, though other aspects of your civilization were more tragical, I can imagine that none could have been more depressing than the poor dinners you had to eat, that is, all of you who had not great wealth. You would have found none of us disposed to disagree with you on that point, I said. The waiter, a fine-looking young fellow, wearing a slightly distinctive uniform, now made his appearance. I observed him closely, as it was the first time I had been able to study particularly the bearing of one of the enlisted members of the industrial army. This young man, I knew from what I had been told, must be highly educated, and the equal, socially and in all respects, of those he served. But it was perfectly evident that to neither side was the situation in the slightest degree embarrassing. Dr. Leed addressed the young man in a tone devoid, of course, as any gentleman's would be, of superciliousness, but at the same time not in any way deprecatory, while the manner of the young man was simply that of a person intent on discharging correctly the task he was engaged in, equally without familiarity or obsequiousness. It was, in fact, the manner of a soldier on duty, but without the military stiffness. As the youth left the room, I said, I cannot get over my wonder at seeing a young man like that serving so contentedly in a menial position. What is that word menial? I never heard it, said Edith. It is obsolete now, remarked her father. If I understand it rightly, it applied to persons who performed particularly disagreeable and unpleasant tasks for others, and carried with it an implication of contempt. Was it not so, Mr. West? That is about it, I said personal service, such as waiting on tables, was considered menial, and held in such contempt in my day, that persons of culture and refinement would suffer hardship before condescending to it. "'What a strangely artificial idea!' exclaimed Mrs. Leed, wonderingly. "'And yet these services had to be rendered,' said Edith. "'Of course,' I replied. "'But we imposed them on the poor, and those who had no alternative but starvation.' and increase the burden you imposed on them by adding your contempt, remarked Dr. Leet. I don't think I clearly understand, said Edith. Do you mean that you permitted people to do things for you which you despised them for doing, or that you accepted services from them which you would have been unwilling to render them? You can't surely mean that, Mr. West. I was obliged to tell her that the fact was just as she had stated. Dr. Leet, however, came to our relief. To understand why Edith is surprised, he said, you must know that nowadays it is an axiom of ethics that to accept a service from another which we would be unwilling to return in kind, if need were, is like borrowing with the intention of not repaying, while to enforce such a service by taking advantage of the poverty or necessity of a person would be an outrage like forcible robbery. 
it is the worst thing about any system which divides men, or allows them to be divided, into classes and castes, that it weakens the sense of a common humanity. Unequal distribution of wealth, and, still more effectually, unequal opportunities of education and culture, divided society in your day into classes which in many respects regarded each other as distinct races. There is not, after all, such a difference as might appear between our ways of looking at this question of service. Ladies and gentlemen of the cultured class in your day would no more have permitted persons of their own class to render them services they would scorn to return than we would permit anybody to do so. The poor and the uncultured, however, they looked upon as of another kind from themselves. The equal wealth and equal opportunities of culture which all persons now enjoy have simply made us all members of one class, which corresponds to the most fortunate class with you. Until this equality of condition had come to pass, the idea of the solidarity of humanity, the brotherhood of all men, could never have become the real conviction and practical principle of action it is nowadays. In your day, the same phrases were indeed used, but they were phrases, merely. Do the waiters also volunteer? No, replied Dr. Leed. The waiters are young men in the unclassified grade of the industrial army who are assignable to all sorts of miscellaneous occupations not requiring special skill. Waiting on table is one of these, and every young recruit is given a taste of it. I myself served as a waiter for several months in this very dining-house some forty years ago. Once more you must remember that there is recognized no sort of difference between the dignity of the different sorts of work required by the nation. The individual is never regarded, nor regards himself, as the servant of those he serves, nor is he in any way dependent upon them. It is always the nation which he is serving. No difference is recognized between a waiter's functions and those of any other worker. The fact that his is a personal service is indifferent from our point of view. So is a doctor's. I should as soon expect our waiter today to look down on me because I served him as a doctor, as think of looking down on him because he serves me as a waiter. After dinner my entertainers conducted me about the building, of which the extent, the magnificent architecture, and richness of embellishment astonished me. It seemed that it was not merely a dining-hall, but likewise a great pleasure-house and social rendezvous of the quarter, and no appliance of entertainment or recreation seemed lacking. "'You find illustrated here,' said Dr. Leet, when I had expressed my admiration, "'what I said to you in our first conversation, when you were looking out over the city, as to the splendour of our public and common life as compared with the simplicity of our private and home life, and the contrast which, in this respect, the twentieth bears to the nineteenth century. To save ourselves useless burdens, we have as little gear about us at home as is consistent with comfort, but the social side of our life is ornate and luxurious beyond anything the world ever knew before. All the industrial and professional guilds have club-houses as extensive as this, as well as country, mountain, and seaside houses for sport and rest in vacations. Note. In the latter part of the nineteenth century it became a practice of needy young men at some of the colleges of the country to earn a little money for their term bills by serving as waiters on tables at hotels during the long summer vacation. It was claimed, in reply to critics who expressed the prejudices of the time in asserting that persons voluntarily following such an occupation could not be gentlemen, that they were entitled to praise for vindicating by their example the dignity of all honest and necessary labour. The use of this argument illustrates a common confusion in thought on the part of my former contemporaries. The business of waiting on tables was in no more need of defence than most of the other ways of getting a living in that day. But to talk of dignity attaching to labour of any sort under the system then prevailing was absurd. There is no way in which selling labour for the highest price it will fetch is more dignified than selling goods for what can be got. Both were commercial transactions to be judged by the commercial standard. By setting a prize in money on his service, the worker accepted the money measure for it, and renounced all clear claim to be judged by any other. The sordid taint which this necessity imparted to the noblest and the highest sorts of service was bitterly resented by generous souls, but there was no evading it. There was no exemption, however transcendent the quality of one's service, from the necessity of haggling for its price in the market-place. 
the physician must sell his healing and the apostle his preaching like the rest. The prophet, who had guessed the meaning of God, must dicker for the price of the revelation, and the poet hawk his visions in printer's row. If I were asked to name the most distinguishing felicity of this age, as compared to that in which I first saw the light, I should say that to me it seems to consist in the dignity you have given to labour by refusing to set a price upon it and abolishing the marketplace for ever. By requiring of every man his best, you have made God his taskmaster, and by making honour the sole reward of achievement, you have imparted to all service the distinction peculiar in my day to the soldiers. End of chapter 14